Hi, I'm Sarah Ting. Did you ever wonder how people like Jess Kane, Tom Ellis, and Lisa Carlin got started in the media? Pure accident. I was an actor in New York for about five years with uh, some success. That is to say, I worked, which in acting is tantamount to success. And I did some live television while I was out there and hosted a kid's show and hosted a movie and that sort of television trivia. I had been in the Navy for a couple of years and worked in a steel mill for about a year and a half. And uh, one of my former college professors called me one day while I was working in the steel mill and said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, you know, I'm... I'm an electrician and uh, making good money, and uh, he said, yeah, but what are you going to do when you get bored with that job? I had left school when I was 18 to work at CAS, which is a station in Cambridge. And at the time, back then, there were very few women on the air, which I think probably served to my credit. Um, I think to make it in this business, actually, you absolutely have to have an over amount of self-confidence. Good evening. Welcome to Interaction. I'm Sarah Ting, and I'm here with Emery Rowan, Nick Young, and Steve Sprager. I'll be speaking to uh, Jess Kane, Tom Ellis, and Lisa Carlin a little later in the show. But right now, let me introduce um, the people that I have here. Emery has been with WITS um, for how long? Emery? A few months. A few months. But she's been in the media for 13 years. Forever. And Nick Young has been in the media for 11 years, and Steve Sprager, our young chick here, has been in. For seven years. The new kid on the block. Right. Well, Anne-Marie, being in the business for 13 years, back then, how difficult was it for a woman to get involved in the media? It's an interesting question. I don't really know. Um, I agree with Lisa that a lot of, um, that, that I was helped an awful lot by the fact that I was a woman. I hope not, that, that wasn't the primary reason. And it's questionable what you mean by making it, too. Who knows what, what that is. Well, can you remember, reminisce all the way back then? What all kind the way of back then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of problems did you run into or conflicts? And, and Nick and Steve, if you could also reminisce back to your period, your early stages, what kind of problems you ran into as a young, as aspiring media person? Well, there are those who tell me I'm still in my youngest stages right now, and uh, it, it's a lot of it's being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, you hang around and you work. Uh, you try and pick up any kind of job you possibly can. I think, isn't that how you got started at one point, Nick? Yeah, basically, um, spending a lot of time at my hometown station and knowing many of the guys on the air, and, and as you say, hanging around looking for any sort of opening uh, that possibly would come up. I was fortunate in that I knew some of the guys, and they let me come in and eventually once they got to know me a little bit better and I got to know the layout they let me run the uh, the console for them while they did their programs and that's how I learned the equipment first of all and then later on I did my audition and got my first job interestingly enough I've never learned the equipment <laughs> still don't know it very well seriously I, I um, never thought about being in this business uh, I was a Russian government major uh, a college graduate who went to Europe for the traditional six weeks in Europe, six weeks fling in Europe with a college roommate. Uh, my college roommate came home and I didn't. I found myself in Paris and very hungry and needed a job. And uh, was actually at the time, this was back in 67, um, at the time was would have taken anything. I was in Paris and spoke no French and had no money and had no, no winter clothing and was heading towards winter. And was, and, and was desperate. My father came through town just coincidentally and suggested that rather than, I, rather than trying for something, uh, starting at the bottom of my list of, of things that I wanted to do in life and working up, such as dental technician, et cetera, which I wasn't qualified to do either, and that I start at the top. And that day that uh, he was in town, I had passed the CBS office in Paris and decided that it was worth a shot and went in and, tr and got a job was in the right place at the right time, as, as uh, Nick and Steve have said. I, um, I was lucky, and it was a time when uh, I don't think I ever thought about being anything more than a research assistant or a secretary or, or just an all-around jack-of-all-trades. I, when I was hired, I think I was hired to be those things and happened to be in the right place at the right time. You'll remember that 67 and 68 were big years news-wise for, for Paris. The uh, Vietnam peace talk started and the students were pulling up cobblestones from the streets and throwing them at the police. 
it was a big news year, and the entire uh, Cronkite unit from CBS came over to Paris in 68, in the spring of 68, and uh, I was considered a, a local girl, meaning a Paris girl. I worked out of the Paris Bureau, so they were very dependent on us. I got to know a lot of people, a lot of important people, and when I was ready to come home a year or so later, Every, uh, people were willing to give me a, a job. Were there a lot of women involved in the media at that time when you got involved? At what level? You mean on the air? On the air? No. As a matter of fact, there were not. And very briefly, to just summarize the rest of my history, I, st I went back to New York. I worked in New York for a year, worked in Washington at, for CBS for a year, and um, went, was out of the, out of the business uh, for a couple of years. And when I decided to go back into the business, had the choice of either going back at the network level in production, which is what I had been in, or trying my luck on the air. And quite frankly, at that time, and that was, let's say, that, that was about 1970, I, there were so few women on the air in the business, the business with a capital B, that I didn't think it was worth going back to, to the network. Now, you, everywhere you look, there's not only one, but, but several women. But at the time, it looked pretty hopeless for women on the air. And I decided that if I wanted, really wanted that, that uh, spot, I had to try a, a local station. Well, it's interesting, in just the brief minutes that we've spoken here, both Steve and Anne Marie have spoken about luck and being at the right place at the right time. Now, you know, I'm wondering, is that what it takes to make it in the media? Well, I think to get to the top, you have to start at the bottom. And I spoke to Tom Ellis, and this is how he got started. I got started in radio back in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I had been in the Navy for a couple of years and worked in a steel mill for about a year and a half. And uh, one of my former college professors called me one day while I was working in the steel mill and said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm an electrician and uh, making good money. And uh, he said, yeah, but what are you going to do when you get bored with that job? Why don't you come on back to college? So in order to do that, I had to go to work. Uh, in other words, work while I was in school. And I went to a radio station in Fort Worth, Texas, a little 250-watt daytimer, KCNC in Fort Worth, and told them I needed a job. And they said, have you had any experience? And I said, no. They said, uh, what can you do? And I said, uh, anything. So they invited me in. Uh, Tom, or, did you have to go knocking on a lot of doors before you finally got an opportunity? No, this was the first station I went to. It was a small station. You see, I didn't aim very high. I just wanted my foot in a door someplace. The fellow showed me the control board, and uh, uh, after about 15 minutes, he walked out. Well, I was very confused, but I was on my own there, on the air, for about a half an hour. So I did a live audition for uh, little KCNC, and they hired me for 50 cents an hour. Well, that's quite a few years ago, and the money wasn't really that important, although I did need it, because I knew that uh, once I got a little experience and had my foot in the door, the next radio station I went to, I could say I'd had some experience, and uh, I would make more money, and that's the way it worked. And then about uh, six years later, I went to work for a radio station as a full-time newsman. During the course of your career, mm -hmm. were you ever at, at any point discouraged at pursuing a career in the media? Well, Did you have any yeah, there were... Uh, downfalls. For the, first, uh, for the first four years I worked in radio, I had, to, I had to work another job to be able to support my radio job because I wasn't making that much money in radio. But the important thing was that I was gaining experience, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that whatever it took, I would continue to do that, to be able to support that radio job. I wasn't sure, to begin with, exactly what I wanted to do. But you had ever at any point uh, want to give up or feel that it was uh, hopeless? No, never. I think that's an important thing for uh, young people who are getting involved in broadcasting. It should be work that you enjoy. I think not only in broadcasting, but any job that, that anybody does should be a job that doesn't really seem what, like work. What kind of hours were you putting in initially? Oh my goodness, uh, when I was in college I was signing on a radio, I was signing on the station at 5 o'clock in the morning and working right straight through until 10 o'clock. Uh, then I'd get off uh, and, and run right out to the university and go to my first class at 11 o'clock and I'd go to class right through until 3 in the afternoon without a lunch break or anything. And Then I'd dash back to the studio and, and uh, go on the air again at 4 o'clock and work during drive time and sign the station off at night. So that'll give you some idea about well, the number of hours. Seeing as you were working so diligently, what about your personal life? How did that, how was that affected? It was a disaster. You don't have any social life. Um, I was married and uh, I had a couple of kids 
and the uh, requirements of, uh, of school and of working uh, didn't really leave much time for, uh, for personal life or for family life. And that's one of the sacrifices that, uh, that I made. I don't say that because I'm happy about it. It's just one of the uh, trade-offs that you have to make. Broadcasting is a, uh, is a demanding mistress. Speaking of demanding, what would you say, uh, as you were speaking earlier of your experience in broadcasting in your earlier stages, mm -hmm. what did you feel you needed the most in terms of um, supporting you through those, those long hours and putting in the time and the energy? What was your support system? energy. You got to have energy. I think if you really like what you're doing, it doesn't make any difference the hours you have to work. Uh, you can still find uh, a way to do it um, and be satisfied basically with life, even though you're going to be frustrated to begin with. As I indicated before, when you get started in this business, you think you know more than anybody else, and chances are you, you might but they're not going to let you come right in and take over immediately. There's a period of uh, almost internship that you have to go through, stewardship of uh, learning the ropes, of learning the diplomatic ropes. Diplomacy in this business is just about as important as talent, you know. Uh, you have to be able to get along with the people around you, especially with the management people around you. Um, you have to be able to sell them on the idea that you're the greatest and that you're going to make them a lot of money and you have to keep good contacts with management people and diplomatic channels have to be open at all, at all times. And all of the contacts you make in this business are important. I'm talking to you right now. Um, you're, a, you're a young lady who obviously is just getting started in this business, but who knows, someday you may be uh, a general manager of a station. Uh, it, n it might not be that long. Thank you for the compliment, John. <laughs> so, okay. so my point is that, uh, that I would like to establish a good relationship with you right now and maintain that relationship because somewhere down the line it might be important to both of us that we had, uh, had a chance to sit down here and do this little interview. Well, that was a very inspiring interview for me. I think that uh, Tom brought out some really good points. He talked about commitment, work, and energy. What was that like for you, Nick and Steve, when you started getting involved? What kind of commitment did that mean to you, and how much time and energy did you have to put in? How did it affect your personal life? Well, it, it, Tom's absolutely right. You've got to have the energy. You've got to have the desire to do it. And then you just, uh, you, there aren't enough hours on the clock. There never were for me. Um, I was fascinated with it. Broadcasting hooked me right from the start. And I found myself working uh, 70, 80, 90 hours a week sometimes uh, because I wanted to. And this was at a small station where you had to do everything, you know, production, uh, news, news writing, uh, news casting, all types of record shows. How did you keep your s sanity working uh, <laughs> those hours? Well, I think there wasn't. Who says he did? <laughs> that's right. That, that's right. Look at me today. Uh, <laughs> I, many times I can remember all, the, the only energy I had was energy to drag myself home, fall down, go to sleep, and then get up a few hours later and start all over again. But there's such, it's like, I don't know, youthful enthusiasm that we have about so many things in our life. And especially about uh, broadcasting, it was just, I just couldn't get enough. So back I went, ready for a new day. Can you describe some of the pressures that you had to deal with? Well, for example, In the newsroom. Being, well, being the youngest, uh, person in town, or perhaps even in the, in the WHDA shop, it took me, I've always wanted to be in broadcasting, as far as I can ever remember uh, when I was uh, young, uh, the first of the TV generation, always electronics, TV, radio, always fascinated me, and I could think of nothing else except wanting to be in broadcasting, and was always trying to find a way to get to a radio station or a TV station and hang around and just see what I could do. And there was always that, uh, that or, well, you're just a little kid, and I always wanted to try and get involved, try and do something. And again, as Nick says, and as Henry said, and Tom, there is that total commitment. Uh, worked for a lot of hours as a, as a stringer uh, in college. Worked, uh, worked at the college radio station, came over here and worked at this very radio station. Uh, again, working 18, 19 hours a day. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure and frustration involved trying to get where you eventually want to be, where you think your goal might be. And then finally, getting into HGH about eight months ago as, a, as then a news editor and wondering, will they accept me? Will, 
when I make a decision to send a reporter somewhere, will he say, no, I don't want to go there. You're only 23 years old. You're only 24 years old. I've had 20 years in the business. That type of thing. You, you, you doubt your own self-confidence at times. There's that kind of frustration and tension. There's also wondering... So when, when you lose your self-confidence, what do you do to gain it back? Well, you've always got to have it. You've always got to say in the back of your mind, even if you don't say it out loud, I know I can do it. I know I have my own abilities. I know exactly what I'm doing, and I know exactly how to do it. And you've got to think like that. You know, I hasten to add, though, that, um, and I certainly agree with what both Steve and Nick have said, that broadcasting is no, um, is no different than any other business. Um, making it to the top of broadcasting is as difficult, but certainly... Um, I don't see it as being any more difficult than making it to the top of General Motors, making it to the top of uh, uh, in, in the field of, of law, in the field of medicine, in the field of whatever. There are many doctors working on the same research projects. There are many voices who would like to be um, th the best at the top. Um, my feeling is that it's important for me personally to compete with myself I don't really worry about the ghosts who are behind me although I know they're there and they're younger and they're better and they've got a higher level of energy and they don't mind making the kinds of sacrifices which are necessary yeah you know I agree with you Amory I don't think it is any different from any other business but I do think that a lot of people have this kind of glamorous image of the media and they don't realize what it takes the time and the it's energy it's a job and the it's a hard job but there are lots of hard jobs it's a hard job that takes a specific talent, and there are lots of people who, provided with a little bit of luck and a lot of work, um, can make it. But I, I don't see it as being, um, maybe because I do it, but I don't see it as being all that glamorous anymore, um, and I don't see it as being all that different from a lot of other um, professions which deserve a lot of respect and which you know, take a it, lot of skill. It's just uh, the difference is that we happen to do what we do uh, before the public. It's very visible, that's all. But if you went into General Motors, you would find people who work every bit as hard as we do at what they do. And uh, again, as Tom mentioned, uh, maintaining the diplomatic channels with management, maintaining contacts with people in other facets of their own business, because you never know. Uh, we, we, we often talk about uh, it's who you know in this business, and, and each of us uh, know many, many different people in, in all over the world, in, in different cities all over the world. So there's that aspect, too. But, again, I think Anne-Marie makes a good point. Uh, the glamour, yes, it's perceived that way, and, there, and then there's no denying that there's an element of that. But it is a lot of hard work. It's a job. And, again, because we do it before the public, we get we get uh, more, exposure. You know, more exposure, that's right. And, and I, I, I want to add something here because it, it, a little light bulb went off in my head when I heard Tom say about uh, maintaining good levels of communication with management. Recently at the um, News Directors Conference in Las Vegas, Howard K. Smith, who is no longer with, with ABC but who for many, many years was um, a pivotal point in the, in, at the American Broadcasting Company, made a statement to young journalists uh, I happen to agree with him rather than with Tom, what Tom had to say. He quoted um, an old uh, um, boss of his who came and, and actually he was just sort of telling a story of saying uh, whenever a new management comes to town and they come to you and say, we really want you to be honest with us, tell us how you feel. I throw this in, it's, it's, it pertains to nothing. It stands by itself. Tell us how you feel, tell us um, you know, really what's on your mind and, and what's going on. He said, Mr. Smith said, uh, a little light bulb ought to go off in the, in the back of your mind, and you ought to lie like hell. <laughs> and I happen to agree with that. Yes, maintain good, good communication with the people that you work with, for sure. But diplomacy is really important, what do you meaning I'm not sure you can be all that honest all the time. Well, I was going to ask you, what do you do in a case where you have a certain value and it conflicts with the management's value? Do you hold those values to yourself when you are in a position where you can affect a community in communication? I think it depends. If you're asking me, I think it really depends. If it's a matter of reporting a story, I think you fight very hard to uh, to make your point. You have to give in. Um, I'm not sure. Nobody has ever pushed me into a corner on a particular story, mm -hmm. ever. I mean, and I've been in the business for a long time. But I certainly have had philosophical differences with the people I've worked for and with, and I've certainly had policy differences. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, and I've fought for them, and I've lost. And I think it's very difficult to fight with the people that pay you. Yeah, how much of yourself can you put in the position and how much of, say, the image that you have is the company's image? 
rather than your your own true feelings or values. Everything I say on the air is my image. Everything, the way I write it, and the way I say it, and the way I report it. Um, certainly, the way I conduct myself within that station is in the company's image. In other words, it's according to what they want. If they want me to show up at seven o'clock, I show up at seven o'clock. If they want me to do the overnight shift, I do the overnight shift. Um, but everything I say on the air during that overnight shift is mine. And I take responsibility for it. If I make a mistake, it's not the company's fault. Although I ref it's, it's a dilemma because you reflect the company, but it's your fault. And I take responsibility for it if I make a factual error or a, or a judgmental error. Uh, every station has a particular image it wants to project. Every station is looking for a uh, different type of talent to do a particular job, be it uh, playing records or hosting a talk show or doing the news. But uh, as Anne-Marie said, within the context of the five minutes that I have twice uh, each hour in the morning, uh, the, the content of the stories, that's my content, my writing. The delivery is mine. I, have, I know that there are certain expectations the company makes of me and certain things that I have to do in terms of the format. But then I have my own expectations too, my own personality to project, and what I feel the audience's expectations are. So you mix that all together and you come up with a style, individual style, and then uh, if you want a corporate style too, uh, the, the public face that a station puts on. You know, it, it, you, it can be raised, and I'm sure all three of us have faced this problem. What do you do when you're a news person and the company wants you to record commercials? Has that ever happened to sure. you? Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not only commercials. Commercials do do I don't mind, but it's bra commercials or, yeah. you know, uh, commercials that you feel compromise your, your um, reputation in some way. You don't know. I mean, you try to work it out and you try to convince them otherwise, or you try to f make sure that the copy of the commercial is such that it won't compromise your reputation or your or your um, credibility. I, I don't know. You don't. You take each... I, I sir, there are no rules here. You really take each case as it comes. Yeah, there's some guidelines and you just, you have to kind of, uh, at each juncture in the road, you have to make a decision uh, based upon your own feeling at the time. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily changeable uh, or change with the winds, but uh, we all go through changes and we all have to analyze the particular circumstance. For instance, before I was at HDH, I worked for WEI, CBS-owned all-news station, and as an anchor man there, I read hundreds of commercials. Just as a matter of course, we read commercials, and in the next breath, we delivered uh, news stories. Uh, I, because of my background, because I came out of programming and I did music before and I've done talk shows before, uh, it didn't present any particular problems for me, and it still doesn't. But I see it as a problem for some people, and I see that it can be a problem, and that each person has to make their own judgment, their own determination. I think if I can, just to back up a little bit, when you asked Anne-Marie about what do you do if management pushes you on a particular story. Okay? Right. In a little different way, uh, I had to set some parameters for myself when I was doing a talk show in Cincinnati. I did one for four years before I came to Boston. And the manager of the station was a very, very, very conservative individual, politically and socially. Uh, politically and socially, I came from a different part of the spectrum. But in conducting the talk show, I tried, first of all, to make it fair to all viewpoints. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be an open exchange of ideas. But this was at a period of time when Watergate was the number one story every hour day after day after day, and people became more acrimonious, more divided. The bitterness increased as time went on, and people started taking shots at everybody. You differ with me, so I'm going to go after you personally. It was an incredible period of time. But I had set up one basic rule when they told me they wanted me to do a talk show. I said, we will discuss everything openly, the management won't come to me and say, you can talk about this, but you can't talk about that, because when that day comes, I will no longer do the show. And I never had a problem until about two days before Nixon announced his resignation, when there was some sort of misunderstanding involving the president of the, broad, of the whole company. A, a listener had written him a letter asking about my own particular stand on some issues regarding Watergate. It filtered down to the general manager of the station. He was very upset and did not want me to talk about Nixon and Watergate anymore. And at that, that point, I told my program director, George Cooper, I said, George, you know my feelings? He said, yes, I do. I said, as far as I'm concerned, last night's talk show was the last one I've done. And I did not go on the air 
that night, and people called and wondered what was up, and I tried to explain to them in a, as non-public a way as I could, and then the next night he resigned, and I felt that it was such an overriding story of, of such consideration that I had to put aside my own personal feelings, and I went on and conducted the program, and in the meantime, I had a chance to talk with the general manager. We got things straightened away to his satisfaction and mine. But again, it all depends. I mean, we all start out with certain ideals. We start out right. idealistically, I think, altruistically in many respects. There are hard realities that we have to face, and there are compromises that you have to make. It's not a business of black and white totally. There are ethics, yes, as there are in every profession, but you've got to be able to bend. There's yeah. also a natural adversary relationship between management and, yes. and on-air people. It has Always. to be. They have to be businessmen. I'm not a business person. I don't care how much profit my station makes. I don't care. Do you find that a conflict? No, I just I just understand it. I mean, it's taken me a long time, mm -hmm. and I've had to be beaten over the head with it often. But I now start to understand it. It's it's the nature of and again, it's the nature of any business. Any business. Any business. It. I mean, there is a there there are those who who are not into the profit end of things who don't I mean but again I care about being paid so I do have to concern myself a bit with with uh, the fact that in our business for example advertisers want to advertise because that's where my pay comes from and that's one of the reasons I go in and, and, and work not the only by far of course not but again and a lot of people always ask me that a lot of people when I give talks or, or do things like this like this show ask me that um, you know don't I of, often wonder uh, why um, certain shows are done they, w the way they are or certain people are hired for what they do or certain things are done I mean just why does management do behave the way it does they they have different concerns than I I don't worry about money I worry about news um, and they worry about making sure that the, that the particular station I'm working at um, keeps bringing in money so it, it's a business you know, as we were sitting here talking, what comes to my mind is, I guess, values and commitments. Well, I spoke to a young lady who knew at a very young age in her life that she wanted to get involved in the media. I uh, started in broadcasting very young. Um, I had left school when I was 18 to work at CAS, which is a station in Cambridge. And at the time, you asked um, me to sort of be specific about how being a woman has affected the path of my career, broadcasting-wise. Um, at the time, back then, there were very few women on the air, which I think probably served to my credit. Um, what gave you the courage to try it? Uh, I've, been <laughs> I've been a real spunky person ever since I was a little kid. I mean, that, the, the courage never, was never a problem, um, I think, to make it in this business, actually. You absolutely have to have an ov over amount of self-confidence because even if you know if you don't believe in yourself, you have to be able to pretend that you do because that's what you do when you're on the air is pretty much present yourself in the most confident state that you can possibly be in. People do not like or relate to um, insecurities coming out either on the radio or on television, whatever you're doing. So it, it really is a question of how much you can sort of pull yourself together and, and just, you know, say, well, no matter how I'm feeling here, you know, I really believe in myself. I've, at least I've got to pretend I do and uh, just go to it. So when I first started looking for a job, it was really a question of that. I really wasn't ready to go on the air and uh, I just had to sort of convince someone that I was and that I or at least that I could learn quickly how to be and that's sort of been what's happened with me. When would you say you were given your first real break or opportunity? I was working at my college radio station at Brandeis um, when I was a freshman and a sophomore and I was working really hard and not making any money for it and I thought well hey <laughs> I ought to get paid for this. So uh, the program director of CAS at the time I would say he probably gave me the biggest break because I had really was pretty incompetent on the air and he sort of really desperately needed a woman and sort of worked with me for a period of months to try to get me in shape to go on the air and finally you know gave me a job and I think that um, it was that kind of foresight. Well, Once you became immersed in the field what kind <laughs> That's a good of, word for it. <laughs> Immersed. What kind of <laughs> obstacles were you for, uh, faced with that you had to overcome as a woman and a well, woman of your age, too? I don't think that, um, professionally speaking, I really had very many obstacles. I've done very well, and it has not been hard, and sometimes I forget how many people there are in broadcasting who um, are, are, don't make it and, you know, who are sort of floundering around looking for work because, you know, the only people I come in contact with are the ones who are working with me or the ones who are working at other stations. And I, So in terms of 
professional obstacles. Certainly my being a woman has never been a problem. I caught it right on the crest of the time when the FCC was really on stations to get women on the air. And so I think my biggest obstacle was that I was really young to be dealing in the circles that I was dealing in. I went to work in New York back in 1975. And I think that it was a question of uh, matching my life to my work rather than my work to my life. And it took a couple of years of adjustments, and it was pretty rough. Well, speaking of matching your life, earlier I spoke to Tom Ellis, mm -hmm. and he described the media as being a demanding mistress. What would you say the media <laughs> has demanded I'd from your certainly life? certainly never call it that. Uh, <laughs> let's see. The media has demanded from my life. Well, the ways it is demanding are that I've been on the radio six days a week for six years. And that's a lot of projecting. That's a lot of, you know, being on the air involves putting yourself out. And the competition is intense now. There are brilliant people on the radio. And so it's like having to push yourself to the most creative you can be every day. And it gets very tiring and it gets um, difficult. And, and when you're having a bad day, you can't be projecting that. People don't want to hear about it. So you got to sort of double back and come up with a new person invented inside you and sort of let it out. And, uh, Is your mind preoccupied with radio 24 hours a day? Not at all. It, it may have been a while ago. No, it really isn't now. So um, you can turn it on and off? Yeah, I have a lot of um, very active interests that I do in my spare Keep time. That, yeah, and most of the people in my life actually are not in the media, which I think is a healthy balance. I mean, I like some people in radio and television. Well, let me but. ask you this, Lisa. <laughs> what direction do you see yourself going in now? I, uh, I'm very interested in public affairs and news. I always have been. Not necessarily being a reporter or being an anchor person at all, but... Um, the political aspects of radio, what and and television. So I, you know, I don't know. I know that I'd like to do. I'd like to go into business for myself at some point, doing some kind of broadcasting work, because I sort of think that's uh, that's a really healthy direction to go, and I'd like to cash in on, you know, and take hold of some of the control of what I do. One other question I want to squeeze in here. What about in terms of marriage and a career? Do you see any conflict in that? What's your um, Well, hey, I live with somebody, and I've lived with them for two years, and uh, I, it never crossed my mind. It has never crossed my mind that I can't have a relationship and a career. Um, I would never be with a man that couldn't deal with that. And... You know, it's like um, when two people are very intense in their careers, as I am with the person I live with, you, you, there's conflicts that arise from that. You're, you're not necessarily both in an uptime simultaneously or a downtime simultaneously, thank the Lord. And consequently, I think there are strains. But that's happening to all kinds of couples where both people work. And I think that um, that's one of the exciting changes in society is that we're adjusting to that and learning how to cope with that, both professionally and uh, emotionally. Thank you, Lisa. I'm here with Amory Rowan, Nick Young, and Steve Sprager, and we've been discussing the media and what it takes to make it in the media. Earlier, we were talking about commitments and conflict of values, say, between yourself and the management. You were talking about commitment, and so was Lisa, uh, and what it does to relationships and what it does to yourself. And during the break, Amory was saying that as this Pope situation has developed, that's the closest she has ever become to becoming totally involved for 24 hours in, uh, in what she's doing for news. As for myself, for a lot of years, that's just about almost the way I was. I lived and slept news, and just my goal for a long time was to get on the air as a reporter <coughs> at a Boston radio station. I have finally done that, but along the way, there were a lot of... Uh, Sacrifices. I had to make a lot of compromises. What kind of sacrifices would you uh, say? Personal life for the most part, uh, working a lot of hours, and a social life. Uh, utterly destroyed one relationship, which just kind of blew apart in January, something that I've been working on for about four years. And finally, the person that I was uh, going with finally said, forget it, no more. You know, you're married to what you're doing, and you're never going to change, and that's it. And it can be like that. It can just be so consuming. You get so caught up in what you're doing, you forget everything else. And that is a danger. And I'm trying to overcome that now, but it's, it's not easy. It really isn't, especially when you're trying to, quote, make it, unquote. Well, Emory, you're involved with somebody now. How is that relationship balancing out with your career? I, it's hard for me to talk about how, how much this business affects any relation. I was married, um, and I was married to someone in this business, and it didn't work. So now I'm involved with somebody who is uh, involved in media, but only peripherally involved in, in what the kind of thing that I do. 
um, and it's fine. Maybe it's the difference in age between Lisa. I mean, Lisa's a very good friend of mine. Um, she's l younger than I am, um, and maybe her conception of commitment to the business and commitment to relationships is different. I, I don't. I don't really see that. If the relationship is good and strong, it will withstand the kind of, of uh, commitments that either party has to make to, uh, to their profession, be it... I mean, can you imagine what, what living with a doctor would be like? Right. He's on call 24 hours a day. He goes out of the house in the middle of the night, and he calls home and says, forget dinner. I've got an appendectomy to do. I've, I really very rarely do that. Yes, I am, I'm immersed right now. Um, because of the upcoming visit by Pope John Paul II, but that's rare. In the in the in the time that I've known the man that I live with, um, that hasn't happened. That really hasn't happened. Other than the fact that I was out of town for for um, eight months, six to eight months, and we saw each other on weekends, but that really wasn't the amount of time being demanded by a particular job. It was really a geographical problem more than anything else. Again, I don't mean to slough it off, but I don't see that as being being a problem. How about about you? Fred? Well, in my case, yeah, it's been a problem. Uh, not, again, and I'll, I'll go back to, uh, to my experience when I was in Cincinnati for four years, and I was not in news. But the hours were the problem because I was working midnight to six in the morning, six days a week. And uh, anyone who's ever tried to maintain any sort of normalcy with those hours knows that it's a problem, no matter if you're working on an assembly line or in a broadcast studio. All right, so it, it was not, what I'm trying to say is that, that the sort of strain that it put on my relationship with my wife, and it was a severe strain, was not endemic to the business, okay? It was, it was simply the hours. And I, again, I could have been doing anything. I could have been, you know, cooking food from midnight to six at a diner and still encountered the same sort of strain simply because we were not together. She was trying to develop her own career at the same time, and it was very difficult. Yeah, I, I just I should add that of course you're right, and this is not a nine to five business. And yeah, in that exactly. respect, it certainly does strain any kind of relationships with with parents, with uh, friends, with with loved ones, with lovers. I mean, it doesn't matter who they are, because you don't have a steady shift. You don't work normal hours. Were there ever times that you had any desire to change your career? That you know, the pressures. Were I don't know great? how to do anything uh -huh. else. That's my no. problem. I really don't. I went through a real, real uh, uh, crisis when I first got to Cincinnati, because I, I was only out of, I was out of college just a few months. I was just a kid, and suddenly I was offered a really incredible job at one of the most well-known radio stations in the country, a, a very powerful radio station that could be heard at 40 states. And they were, they called me up and said, "We want to, we want to hire you." They flew me into to the city to see the. You know, for a kid, this is just out of college. This was, it just blew me away, you know. And uh, so I, I got there and then found that I was having problems dealing with, with what I felt were the expectations made of me. And, uh, and, and after that, it caused me some identity problems in trying to put it all together. I finally did, but not only on my own, but because I had some help from other people. I'll give you a one-word answer, no. You never had any never. desire to change? No. Well, I spoke to a young lady who did change, but she didn't change out of the media business. She changed into it. I'd come as a student intern, really not expecting to be given too much responsibility. Well, little did I know that they wanted to use you and put you to work right away. And they sent me out to cover a tugboat sinking, and I got out to the scene with no notebook and no pencil and not having the vaguest idea of what was going on, and you know, rushed around, gathered the information, and came back and was asked to write my first news story from that. So it was, in essence, it really was on-the-job training, on-the-job learning. Well, there are a lot of young people today, I think, who are getting involved in the media through internship. But at what point did you decide that you were really committed to the media? I always loved news. I was a news bug. My family was, that was the, always the topic of conversation, every dinner table conversation. But the media itself is what fascinated me. And at first I thought I wanted to be a photographer. That's, I went into the business really to be a camera person. But I quickly found out that the equipment at that point was too heavy for me to be able to manage it and do a good story. And secondly, that the, the really fun creative part was in producing the story, putting it together, writing it, doing the interview. And so I had been teaching school for a couple of years, and I went back to school to get a master's and work with film. Uh, when I did that, 
I was sent on an internship to a news station and thought that this was going to be like a three-month learning experience. And as I say, my first day on the job, it was so intriguing to me. And all of a sudden it came to me, that, yeah, this is it. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is a career that's perfect for me. W what kind of feeling was it? Really exhilarating to find the slot that feels right for you and to find a job that is stimulating enough and where you think you can grow in it. It, it was really an exciting day. So when did you get the opportunity that led you to the point that you are now? Well, I suppose... I always count the day of my biggest break being a day that Richard Burton, the actor, gave a waitress a diamond ring up in Northern California because what happened that day was they had to send a reporter to go up and cover that gossipy little story. They sent me out and they said, you can go ahead and you can write the narration and you can voice it yourself and you can actually appear in the piece. And so that was my first big break. From then on, once they found, uh, once the news management people found that they could count on you, that they could in fact send you out and you'd come back with a decent story, then whenever anyone was sick or on vacation, they began to rely on me, and within a couple of months, I was, in fact, uh, a regular reporter. I was put on the reporting staff. Do you find that you have, being in the media, do you have to be a pretty aggressive or assertive person to kind of make your niche in the media? Yeah, you d I don't think you have to be obnoxious, which is some people's view of being in the media, but you do have to be assertive, you have to be persistent, and you have to go after the information. You have to not be afraid to walk down a room crowded with 500 people and plant yourself right up in front of the microphone. You have to not be uh, intimidated by public officials so that you're afraid to ask the important questions. You know, as you're talking about covering news stories and being assertive, what also comes to my mind is the fact that you have to deal with a lot of pressure. Now, how do you deal with it? I find I'm the kind of person who thrives on pressure. I really do much better on pressure. And I think if you're interested in a career in the media, that's something you ought to really know about yourself. Because if you don't deal well with pressure, and if you don't like it, if you don't enjoy it, you really would not like this business. Have you ever felt threatened by other women or other uh, news reporter? Hmm. Who was it? who said, don't look over your shoulder, they might be gaining on you. I think, I think my attitude has basically been to pursue my own career and do the best I can and try to stay out of petty politics or try not to see myself in competition with other people, particularly with other females, and rather pursue my career and do the best I can at it. The only kind of comparisons I like to make is when I see something that someone's doing that I really admire and I say, gee, that's a good technique. I don't mind stealing the technique at all. So what would you attribute your success to? I can attribute my success to a lot of people who have helped me out over the years. Um, but in terms of personal qualities, I think the things you have to have a natural curiosity about everything. You have to be the kind of person who likes to talk to people on street corners and pick up little tidbits at the hairdressers or whatever. You have to read a lot in all kinds of fields. You have to keep current constantly. And at the same time, I think working on writing abilities, you have to love to write and love to communicate. But I think in general, that's one of the most exciting things to me about this business because you have to be wide open to the world around you as it is. And you're learning and growing all the time and being introduced to new people and new topics that you never would have thought you'd be involved with. So what words of wisdom would you give to any young future media person? Okay, I, w I would never try to discourage someone from getting into the media because I love it. Um, I know that there are very few jobs available, but I am convinced that the jobs are there for the people who really want them. And if you want something badly enough and you go after it and you prepare yourself for it, that they're there. So I would say don't give up. Keep at it. Keep at it. That was Mary Richardson that I was speaking to, and she's been keeping at it. She's only been in the business for six years, and she's attained quite a success for herself. Anne Marie, earlier you had mentioned about talent. What would you say, how much of your success is due to your innate talent, and how much of it is acquired skills or talent? I think that getting on the air was innate talent because I was born with this voice, and staying in it was acquired. That's good the, point. That's it. What about you guys? Yeah, I'd have to say uh, God gives you certain equipment, okay? And you've got that to start with, but then it's a, I, then it's a lot of work, a lot of work. And I know that I, I worked very, very hard to, to perfect whatever I had. Definitely, a lot of it is developed. Uh, I know in my case, I'm not, I wasn't born with a beautiful voice. I don't look really good, can't make it in TV probably. So what skills I had, I had to work very hard to develop, and that would be uh, just till it becomes second nature, till you can go out to a, a news event, know immediately what you're going to do, how you're going to play the story, what angles you're going to use, just how to cover it. You've got to require, for at least in my case, most of it was acquired. 
If, well, if I can just echo one thing that Mary said, and that is for those who are thinking about getting into the business and who might be discouraged by something they might have heard us or, or someone else say, keep at it. The jobs are there, and if you want something badly enough, you can get it. Definitely. Definitely. And that's something I say everywhere I go to anybody who asks. Exactly. Keep plugging. Well, what do you do if you don't have the innate talent of the beautiful voice? You keep at it. That's right. You keep, keep at it. Keep working at it. This business, I'm telling you, virtually any talent you've got, there's a spot for you in this business. You know, you may say, I've got to be on the air. But you may come to realize that you just don't have the talent to be on the air, okay? But if you've got writing ability or production ability or some management. other management ability, there's any number of jobs you can have. And, you know, you may start out with one thing in mind and find yourself shifting your focus as time goes by. But stay with it. And call anybody you can think of who might be able to help That's you. That's right. Including us. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Use any, any lever you've got. Were As Tom Ellis told you. <laughs> Thanks, Anne-Marie. Well, were there ever any points in any of your careers that you felt like giving up, that you were discouraged? Yeah. I, w I was alluding to it before uh, when I went through this, uh, this particular identity crisis where I really didn't feel that I had the talent to do what I was doing. I felt like I was spinning my wheels. And it was a very serious thing. I got to the point where I feared going into the station each evening to do my program. What brought you to that point where you feared that you weren't succeeding? I think I, I felt as if uh, I was in over my head. I was very young and I was at this huge station and there was a great deal of expectation as to what I was to be doing. I was doing a music program at the time in a very personality oriented station. I was working with guys who averaged 15 years in the business. These guys were giants. I'd been in radio three years and I just didn't know. I didn't know who was, who was the real me, what was going to be coming out in terms of my own personality and projecting it and getting it to fall into all the little grooves that it has to fall into before people start to really identify with you the way they've identified with, well, any, the man I work with in the morning. Jess Kane, uh, most especially, but there are dozens like him. And I got, so I got to the point where I just, all of these things were just seemed to be working against me, and it was only when I got away from a particular shift, got involved with doing something else, eventually got involved with doing talk, that I started to get my head screwed on a little bit straighter, and I got my confidence back. Well, Nick, speaking of Jess Kane, he's been in the business for 23 years, and we've been talking about people who are aspiring to get into the media, and that's their lifelong ambition. Well, ironically, Jess Kane fell into it. Pure accident. I was an actor in New York for about five years with uh, some success. That is to say, I worked, which in acting is tantamount to success. When it was first presented me, I wound up going to Notre Dame, where I worked as a teacher, more or less, uh, an instructor in communications. And I did some live television while I was out there and hosted a kid's show and hosted a movie and that sort of television trivia. And then went, uh, they approached me and said, there's some radio time available. And I kept saying, no, radio's dead. It's all pictures now. No, uh, no more just sound. It's all pictures, which shows you what I know. And I wound up almost under duress doing some radio, and I rather enjoyed doing it. I never thought it would endure. I thought television would wipe it out completely. I'd done some radio acting in New York when I was an actor in the latter, the latter day radio soap operas, but I'd never done that, the kind of radio I've been doing for 23 years, which is, quote, personality radio. And so I did some of that out there and kind of enjoyed it. And then I was brought to Boston to host a movie again in television. They had no movies. They asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I don't know, something. And uh, so they said, fine, how about radio? And I said, again, no, no, radio's dead. It's all pictures now. No more sound, just sound. It's going to be sound and pictures, but mostly pictures. And under duress once again, I wound up not choosing, but accepting radio. Well, you've been on radio now for 23 years and in the same time slot? Yep, six to ten mornings, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Like in the beginning of your career, how did it affect your personal life? Did you find any conflict in terms of your career and your personal life? Well, what it did was to eliminate the personal life, so there was no conflict at all. My personal life ended as a result of my job. And as most young people, which I was at the time, I was in my uh, late 20s, I thought the thing to do was to succeed, you know, and to put all my efforts into my career, so to speak, and did. What would you say has kept you going on for the past 23 years? What's been your biggest support? Certainly doesn't sound uh, terribly brave. I guess uh, fear of failing is what's kept me going. 
I knew failure as an actor. I had five years of success. I can't say five all told, maybe four years of success. The final year was terribly frightening because I couldn't get work as an actor. There wasn't that much work around. And for the first time in my life with a wife and a child, and another one on the way, I needed work. And I never wanted to experience that fear again. So I guess it was fear of failure that uh, kept me striving for, quote, success, end quote. Your success, would you say it's been a gradual success? It wasn't overnight. No, I don't think there is any such thing as overnight success. There is overnight false success, which is media created, that sort of thing where somebody... Was there ever a point where you were discouraged? I don't think so. I don't think really discouraged. Yes, I was. there were minor points where I, I was discouraged, but I was never discouraged about what I was doing. I was discouraged about that which I was doing not having a place to be done. Uh, we went through a license change when television was taken away from the old Channel 5. It looked like uh, the career was going to crumble. And, uh, you know, so, for example, a, an actor remains a good actor if he's in a play that closes in two nights. It's difficult for him to accept that, that he's still a good actor. He's got to feel it's his responsibility. That's one of the problems with performing for a living. You are your product. So if you have a bad day or a day where you're presenting your product to those who judge and you're turned down, uh, the vacuum cleaner salesman can rationalize and sublimate and say the problem lies in the product. I've been given a terrible product to sell. Nobody could sell this product. The actor, however, is vulnerable constantly. He is his own product. And if they say no to him, they're saying no to him. So he's rejected simultaneously with that which he is selling which is himself. Well, Jess, let me ask you, then, what would you say has been the key to your success? I don't know whether I've uh, fully achieved success or not. I don't say that with any kind of false modesty. I don't believe, you know, I, I think to have success as a goal, in retrospect, was a mistake if I ever did entertain that notion. I guess to have lasted as long as I have, which is perhaps in some people's minds success, it's just uh, persistence, I suppose. Not feeling I've achieved the goal, therefore I can now relax. I relax for other reasons, but I don't relax because I set a goal, I attained it. I just believe that there is no satisfaction in this life. There is only gratification and the constant urge, desire, whatever it might be that uh, has you seeking gratification is enough to keep you going. But if satisfaction by the same token be defeating because if you're totally satisfied then the joy goes out of what you've done and you have to seek another avenue of quote satisfaction and if you believe that there's only gratification and that perhaps that's what the afterlife is satisfaction and it's unattainable in this world in its stead you can get gratification if you choose gratification I think uh, you'll be happier for it gratification seems to be Jess's fulfillment in the media what kind of gratification do you get Amory, Steve and Nick goodness I, I don't know. I, um, I find that I also get a lot of satisfaction. I'm never 100% satisfied, but I like, I feel satisfied by a lot of things that I do. I mean, at the end of a given day or a given project, I find myself feeling satisfied. There's always a new project. There's always another day. I certainly get a, a lot of gratification or else I wouldn't stay in it. I like the work. I love the work. Um, no question about it. I don't know if I've made that clear but I do love it and I wouldn't want to do anything else. What words of wisdom would you offer people who are aspiring to enter the field, the media? Keep at it. Yeah, really persistence. Uh, don't be discouraged if you, f if you don't think you've got the greatest voice in the world or if perhaps you don't think that you're the best writer in the world or whatever. If you got the bug, if you want to communicate with people, you're going to find a way to do it in this business. And don't let anyone discourage you. Don't, I mean, how many times have we all been told, forget it, kid. Forget it, you're not going to make it. Uh, I've been told that lots of times. And I said, thank you very much, and knocked on another door. Well, let's hear what other people have to say about pursuing the media. If it's something you really like to do, it doesn't seem to be work. I mean, you may put in long hours, and you may have faced a lot of frustrations, and obviously you will. You won't always be doing what you think you do best, or you won't always be able to use your creative uh, abilities. But you still have to go through that grind and be committed. Otherwise, if you're not, you should get out and try something else. Work harder than all of these other swarms of people who are coming out the doors today. And uh, if you do that, and you stick with it, and you have that commitment, 
and you have some talent to go with it, you'll rise to the top. It's not an easy career, and I think that if you really want to do it, you do it. And you put up with what goes along with that. And if you uh, find it too bizarre, I don't think there's anything wrong with sort of going into the media for a while. And, and if it's not meeting with your head and your heart and the way you want to live, there's nothing wrong with sort of backing away from it. I think that if I can be, to any extent, called successful in it, you will obviously have to say one doesn't have to be glamorous, okay, because that I'm not. Also, you don't have to have broadcasting training, because that I don't have either. Nor do you have to have the great radio voice. Clearly, there is room for people who aren't standard, because I'm not very standard, that's for sure. So the only advice, you know, if you're going to go into any kind of media, I would read. I, I would do that for life. I would do that to see, never mind a career, and life overall. I would read everything I can get my hands on. And each day I find in the four hours, for example, on the air, I find myself reaching back and finding something that I remembered that I never thought I would remember even when I was reading it. You do. You, one retains more than one thinks one retains. So I would say just constantly prepare for life and the career will take care of itself. You've been listening to Interaction, a community service of MIT. This is WMBR in Cambridge. Next week we'll be talking to some people about East Coast living versus West Coast living. Stay tuned now for Sunita and her Indian music.